Hey everyone, welcome back. Ready for another deep dive. Today, we're tackling something pretty fundamental to life as we know it, photosynthesis. Yeah, photosynthesis, huh? Sounds a little dry, maybe. Maybe, but trust me, it's anything but. We're going way beyond the basic plants use sunlight to make food stuff. Right, right. We're gonna really dig into the mechanics of how it all works. Like how do those green machines turn sunlight into, well, pretty much everything we depend on? Well, that's what makes it so fascinating. I mean, photosynthesis is really the foundation of almost every ecosystem on the planet. Yeah, think about it. It's this giant energy conversion system. I mean, it's turning sunlight into the food we eat and the oxygen we breathe, you know? So this chapter we're looking at, it covers everything from the big picture role of photosynthesis, like you're talking about, down to the tiny details, right? Absolutely, yeah. Starts with the basics. You've got your autotrophs. Those are the self-feeding organisms like uh, plants and algae. They use photosynthesis to grab that light energy and convert it into chemical energy. Oh, yeah, producers. Exactly. And then you've got the heterotrophs like us. We can't make our own food, so we rely on those autotrophs, you know? They're consumers, yeah. So it's kind of like plants are the chefs of the planet, right? Yeah. Whipping up this feast using sunlight. Uh -huh. And we're all just kind of showing up to enjoy the meal. That's a great way to put it. It really is. And it's not just about the food either, right? I mean, photosynthesis produces the oxygen we need to breathe. Yeah. Every breath. It's pretty wild when you think about it. Like every breath we take is connected to this incredible process that's happening in you know, plants all around us. So that's the big picture. But what about those tiny kitchens where all the magic actually happens? The chloroplasts? Ah, uh, the chloroplasts, yeah. They've got this amazing internal architecture. It's perfectly designed for capturing and converting that light energy. You've got this double membrane enclosing this space called the stroma, right? Okay. And inside, you've got these stacks of... Um, flattened sacks called thylakoids. They look kind of like a stack of pancakes, if you can imagine that. Okay, I can picture that. And embedded in those thylakoid membranes, that's where you find the star of the show, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, right. Right. It gives plants their green color. It's that pigment that's grabbing all that sunlight. Yeah. But how does it actually work, like, at the molecular level? Well, we got to think about light as a form of energy that travels in waves, right? And chlorophyll is specifically designed to capture certain wavelengths of light in the visible spectrum. Okay. Particularly um, in the violet, blue, and red ranges. Ah, that's why plants look green to us. Mm -hmm. They're absorbing all those other colors and reflecting back the green. Exactly. And when chlorophyll absorbs a photon of light, one of its electrons gets bumped up to a higher energy level. It's like it gets this sudden burst of energy and jumps up a step. Okay, so now we've got excited electrons. What happens next? Well, now, if you just had chlorophyll, like, floating around by itself, those excited electrons, they would quickly lose their energy, right? Fall back down, mm. releasing that energy as heat and a little bit of red light. We call it fluorescence. So that's why a spinach smoothie doesn't, like make my kitchen glow in the dark. Right, exactly. But inside a chloroplast, things get a lot more interesting. The chlorophyll molecules are organized into these complexes. We call them photosystems. Photosystems. They sound a bit like something out of Star Wars. Yeah, a little bit, right? But each photosystem, it consists of a reaction center complex surrounded by these light harvesting complexes. And these light harvesting complexes act like antennas, capturing photons of light and funneling that energy to the reaction center. Okay, so it's like a network of tiny solar panels all channeling energy to this central power station. Perfect analogy. And at the heart of that reaction center is a special pair of chlorophyll molecules. Now, we've got two types of photosystems, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. Right. Each has its own special chlorophyll, a pair, P680 and P700, respectively. Okay, so we've got the light energy being captured, exciting electrons in the special chlorophyll, a pairs. But what happens to those energized electrons? Do they just, like, say excited? That's where things get really interesting. These excited electrons, they go on this remarkable journey. It's a chain reaction of electron transfers that really drives this whole process of converting light energy into chemical energy. Lead the way. We're ready to follow those electrons on their adventure. All right, so we're back. And those energized electrons, they're ready to start their journey. We call this linear electron flow. And it's how light energy gets turned into the chemical energy that powers life as we know it. Okay, so it's like each of these electrons is carrying this precious cargo, like a tiny little bundle of energy captured from the sunlight. So where do they go first? First stop is photosystem two. Remember that special pair of chlorophyll molecules, P680? Yeah. When light hits it and excites an electron in P680, that electron is really quickly snatched up 
by a molecule we call the primary electron acceptor. Okay, so it's like a relay race, right? Exactly. P680 passes the energy baton to the primary electron acceptor. But now P680 is missing an electron. What happens then? Well, this is where it gets really cool, right? To replace that missing electron, P680 basically steals one from a water molecule. Well, wait, steals an electron from water? How does that even work? Okay, so there's this enzyme in photosystem two. And this enzyme, it can split water molecules. And when it splits those water molecules, what you get is electrons, hydrogen ions, protons, and oxygen as a byproduct. Hold on. Are you saying that the oxygen we breathe, like the stuff that keeps us alive, that's basically just a leftover from plants splitting water? Yeah, pretty much. It's pretty amazing, right? That is mind-blowing. So those electrons from the water, they go back and replenish P680, and that lets it keep capturing light energy and keep passing those energized electrons down the chain. Okay, so the electron's on the move. Where does it head to next? From that primary electron acceptor, the electron basically hops down this chain of molecules. We call it the electron transport chain. Right, like a series of steps. Exactly, yeah. And with each step down, a little bit of energy is released. And that relieved energy, that's what's used to pump protons across the thylakoid membrane, right? You got it. From the stroma into the thylakoid space. So we're building up this concentration of protons inside that thylakoid space. Yeah. Kind of like bumping air into a tire. Yeah, perfect analogy. And all those protons, they create what we call a proton gradient. Basically, a difference in concentration on either side of that membrane. Oh, okay, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. This is starting to sound familiar. We talked about proton gradients back when we were discussing cellular respiration. This is all about chemiosmosis, isn't it? You got it. That proton gradient, it's like potential energy, like water stored behind a dam. And just like a dam can release water to generate electricity, that proton gradient can be used to power the production of ATP. ATP, the cell's energy currency. Right. So we're literally seeing the energy from sunlight being transformed into this usable form that the cell can use. Exactly. But while that first electron is busy helping create that proton gradient, the story is not over yet. Photosystem use is also absorbing light and exciting electrons. So it's like we have two separate relay races happening side by side. You got it. So Photosystem Bi has its own special chlorophyll pair. It's P700, and it's got its own primary electron acceptor, too. Okay. The excited electron from P700, it gets passed down another electron transport chain. But this time, instead of creating a proton gradient, the electron ultimately gets passed to a molecule called NADP plus LAA, reducing it to NADPH. NADPH, another energy carrier molecule. Right. So we've got ATP being produced through chemiosmosis and NADPH being generated. Yeah. And all this is happening thanks to the power of sunlight and these complex electron relay races. That's the magic of the light reactions right there. Light energy has been transformed into chemical energy stored in ATP and that reducing power of NADPH. So the light reactions have set the stage, hmm. and now we've got the fuel we need to actually start building those sugars. Exactly. And those sugars are built in the next stage, the Calvin cycle. Right, the sugar factory. Uh -huh. I can't wait to see how it all comes together. But before we jump into that, the chapter mentioned another pathway called cyclic electron flow. Ah, yeah, good catch. Cyclic electron flow. This one only involves photosystem one. So no photosystem two, no water splitting, no oxygen production. What's the point of this cyclic route then? Well, in cyclic electron flow, that excited electron from P700, it doesn't end up reducing NADP plus or right side. Instead, it cycles back to that first electron transport chain, and that helps contribute to that proton gradient. And ultimately, that means more ETP. Oh, interesting. So it's like a shortcut that focuses on boosting ATP production. Exactly. And research suggests that cyclic electron flow, it might be really important for protecting plants from damage, especially under those really high light conditions. Okay, so we've got linear electron flow and cyclic electron flow, both generating ATP, but only one producing NADPH. Busy place, these light reactions. But now I think we're finally ready to enter the sugar factory itself. The Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle. This is where the carbon dioxide from the air is transformed into the building blocks of life. Now that sounds like some serious magic. Let's see how it all works. Yeah. Okay, so we've been through the light reactions, seen those electrons zipping around, and how ATP and NADPH are made. But now, let's get to the main course, right? The Calvin cycle. It's like, this is where those energy molecules get put to work, building sugars from CO2. 
I mean, it's happening right now in every leaf and every blade of grass out there. It's pretty remarkable when you think about it. The Calvin cycle is like this intricate metabolic machine, you know, it's just churning away inside the chloroplast stroma using all that ATP and NADPH that was made in the light reactions to, well, convert that inorganic carbon dioxide into organic sugars. So it's like the light reactions provide the ingredients and the Calvin cycle is like the chef following this recipe to make those sugar molecules. I like that analogy. And like any good recipe, the Calvin cycle has these key steps. So first up, we have what we call carbon fixation, where CO2 gets incorporated into an existing organic molecule. So it's like grabbing that carbon from the air and attaching it to something that a plant can actually use. Exactly. And the star of this step is an enzyme called Rubisco. You know, it's actually the most abundant protein on Earth. And it's probably one of the most important, too, because it catalyzes that first step in converting atmospheric CO2 into organic molecules. Rubisco, the carbon capture. Yeah. Got it. But you mentioned something earlier called photorespiration. And it sounded like Rubisco can sometimes mess up and grab oxygen instead of CO2. Yeah, that's right. Rubisco evolved way back when the atmosphere had a lot less oxygen, so back then this whole oxygen grabbing thing wasn't really a big deal. But these days, with all the oxygen we have, photorespiration can kind of drag down a plant's efficiency. So instead of fixing carbon, sometimes Rubisco kind of throws a wrench in the works, it wastes energy and releases CO2. Doesn't that seem counterproductive? I mean, if it's so wasteful, why hasn't evolution gotten rid of it? Well, it's not quite that simple. I mean, photorespiration does have a few benefits. For example, it can help protect plants from damage when there's a lot of light. And some studies suggest it might even play a role in nitrogen metabolism. But yeah, it's definitely something that could be more efficient. So even nature's best enzyme has its quirks. But the chapter mentions some plants that have evolved ways to actually minimize this photorespiration problem. Right especially the plants that are living in those really hot, dry places. That's right. Those are the C4 and CAM plants, you know, like corn, sugarcane, cacti, pineapples, things like that. They've come up with some really clever strategies to concentrate the CO2 in their cells, which makes Rubisco more efficient and cuts down on photorespiration. Okay, let's break that down a bit. First, the C4 plants. How do they manage to concentrate that CO2? Well, C4 plants, they have this unique leaf structure. They have these special bundle sheath cells, and those cells are where the Calvin cycle actually takes place. And get this, those cells are surrounded by mesophyll cells. And in those mesophyll cells, the CO2 is fixed by a different enzyme. It's called PEP carboxylase, and it has a much higher affinity for CO2 than Rubisco does, and it doesn't bind to oxygen. Ah, so they've kind of bypassed Rubisco for that initial carbon capture step. That's pretty clever. It is. So this PEP carboxylase fixes the CO2 into a four carbon compound, and then that gets transported to the bundle sheath cells. And there, that four carbon compound is broken down, which releases the CO2 and concentrates it right near Rubisco. And that lets the Calvin cycle run efficiently, even when the plant's stomata are partially closed to save water. So it's like they've built this little CO2 pump delivering it right to where it's needed. Yeah, it's a great way to think about it. Now, CMM plants, they have a different approach. They separate carbon fixation and the Calvin cycle in time instead of space. Oh, interesting. So instead of different cells doing different jobs, it's the same cells but working at different times. Exactly. So CAM plants, they open their stomata at night when it's cooler, and they don't lose as much water. They take in the CO2, and they convert it into organic acids, storing them in their vacuoles. And then during the day, they close their stomata to conserve water, and then they release that CO2 from the stored organic acids, and that feeds into the Calvin cycle. Wow. So it's like they're stockpiling CO2 overnight, and then they use it during the day to make sugar when there's sunlight to power the process. That's amazing. It's pretty ingenious. These adaptations let those C4 and CAM plants thrive in those hot, dry climates where other plants would really struggle. It really shows how evolution can come up with these really elegant solutions to those tough environmental challenges. So we've covered the ins and outs of photosynthesis, from the light reactions to the Calvin cycle, and even those awesome adaptations like C4 and CAM. But what's the big takeaway here? Like, why should we care so much about all of this? Well, for me, the most important takeaway is that photosynthesis, it's not just this biological process. It's the foundation of pretty much all life on Earth. I mean, it provides the food we eat, the oxygen we breathe, and it plays this huge role in regulating the climate of our entire planet. It's easy to forget about that connection, especially when you're focused on the details of chloroplasts and enzymes and all that. It is. But every bite of food, every breath we take, it's all thanks to the power of photosynthesis. 
understanding how it works and how plants have adapted to all these different environments, it's crucial if we want to tackle these global challenges like climate change and food security. I think next time I see a plant, I'm going to look at it with a whole new level of respect. I think we all should. I mean, these plants are quietly powering our planet. And the more we understand them, the better we can protect them and the ecosystems that we all depend on. Well, that wraps up our deep dive into photosynthesis. We've gone from sunlight to sugar, explore the inner workings of chloroplasts, and we even got into the ecological implications of different photosynthetic pathways. We hope you enjoyed the journey and learned something new about the wonders of the natural world. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.